Thank you, Randy. I appreciate that. You know, during good days and bad days, it's awesome to see how God works within our hearts and stirs our passion within our life. You know, when you think about teenagers and think about decisions that they have made and these five individuals that stood across as just a, just a glimpse of what decisions were made at camp. And we've all made decisions. How do we keep those decisions, those passions, those desires that we have at one time within our life, how do we keep that gift, that passion stirred up within our life? It's easy to sometimes go into a path and make decisions and have a fully aware heart at one time, but yet because of life things happen, it's easy to fall away. How do we stir up that gift? How do we keep that passion to be vital within our life? I think there has to be some overwhelming things within our life that we have to have that, that supersedes just emotion. Because when we make decisions on emotion, emotions change. Circumstances happen. And if I'm only happy, if I only have passion during the good days, Satan, oh, he's going to make tomorrow a very sad day. But if those decisions that we made at camp or in life, if those decisions are rooted deep within our soul, during the good days, I can praise. Or in the sad days, I can praise. Or if I could say, during the good days when I'm at camp, I'm around the Christian influence, I can stand up and I can be accountable for Christ. But what about when camp is over with? What about the spiritual influence is gone and I'm a light in a very dark world? Can I go back and remember the decision that I made to be the missionary, to be the Christian, that I can stand up in the middle of a dark world? What is the importance of our life? How do we make that sustain into our future? You know, we, we just had some bad news just this morning. One of the, one of the Palmer girls, uh, one of the Palmer boys uh, that lived in Kansas City, his name is Emmanuel Palmer, 16 years of age drowned yesterday in Kansas City. You know, Mike and Damon Palmer are members and their families here. The kids went to camp. Here, a 16-year-old boy. Life is gone. At 16, your life is in front of you. How important is camp? How important is it to know that your child would be in heaven? Decisions that we make at a very early age definitely impact our life. But sometimes those decisions that we make, the passion within our life, sometimes it's very easy to put that passion that once we had, that, that vitality for life, that energy that we had for life, sometimes we can put that on coast mode, and sometimes that coast mode supersedes what we do, and we just do things out of obligation instead of passion. We do things because it's Sunday morning. We do things because it's the right thing to do. There's a story in Revelation chapter 2. It's talking about the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus, one of the seven churches in Revelation, and they were doing a lot of great things. They were doing a lot of good things. But the Bible says, let, let's read this in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Let's look, how, you know, when you look at this church, and the church is doing a wonderful job until one point. And I would say if the church was doing all these great things, I would say this church was a successful church. It had ministry involved. It was reaching people for Christ. It was standing up for the gospel. It was proclaiming the truth, but out of obligation not out of passion. And sometimes when we go through church, we go through life, or we go through school, well, there has to be something deeper within our soul than just information and obligation. It has to be stirred up gifts within our soul, within our life. Because if we don't serve God out of our love, out of our enthusiasm deep within our soul, circumstances and junk will take place within our life and we'll lose that zeal and that passion. And then we just go into the mundane. And if we go into the mundane, we'll just do things because of obligation. 
And sooner or later, that obligation becomes unwarranted. There's nothing there. We go to church because it's Sunday. We go to church because we have to. We read the Bible because we're supposed to. We don't, we don't worship God because we love him. We worship God because the band is playing. We don't read the Bible because we want to. We read the Bible because the preacher's standing up reading the Bible. We don't talk to people about Christ because we're embarrassed that we're a Christian. We do so out of obligation. And I believe in this church of Ephesus, one thing that we could learn is that we can do things and we can do good things. But doing good things is not honoring to God. They're pleasing to God, but honoring God is much different than pleasing God. To the angel of the church of Ephesus writes, These things say he who holds these seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those things who say the apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have preserved and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have become weary. In other words, you were doing all these great things. But he says, nevertheless, I have, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Here's a phrase, you have left your first love. What's talking about the, the desires that you have when you gave your life to Christ, the commitment that you have given to him, that you called it Wednesday night in, in, a, in a worship experience. You came to a point in your life and you had passion. You desired him. You didn't care what people thought. You didn't care if you cried. You didn't care what people thought. You had an ultimate desire to honor Christ at all expense. That's your first love. Because your first love is the transformation of Jesus Christ within your life. And you didn't care what people thought. How do we continue to have a burning desire within your life, to have a passion for Christ above all things, but going through life to not allow the stuff of life to deter what Christ ultimately wants within your life? Because there's a difference between serving Christ, doing the Christian thing, than to have a passion, a deep desire, passion. George Gallup made a survey of 1,300 individuals that had left church, and they said, I have no desire to go back to church. What would, in, what would inspire you to, re, to go back to church? The number one response to those that left church at an early age and had no desire to go back to church was this, that the church and the leaders and the pastor has a genuine passion for what they talk about. A genuine passion. Not just information. Not just a compelling reason. But a deep, burning passion that what we're talking about could change your life. That is something real. The church of Ephesus was going through the motions. They were teaching the classes. They were sacrificing for ministry. They were doing the right thing, but they were doing it for the wrong reason. And sometimes I believe our churches and our lives, we do things because we should, but are we doing them because it's our passion? Because that's what Christ has sacrificed and he's died for us. I believe it's very important. A healthy church begins with a consuming passion for God. A consuming passion. What is passion? The dictionary says that passion is an intense emotion, a strong feeling, a great devotion, and an intense conviction that fuels and motivates us to a compelling action. Do we have something deep within our soul? Is Christ and his salvation to us enough for us to have passion to communicate him to a lost and dying world? 
Is our salvation something that we look at our fire insurance, or is it something that's deep within our soul, a compelling force that people can see that it's not just about me? I know what God has done for me, but I have a passion for others to see what Christ can do through them. We have to have a passion for Christ. That's what our passion is. But the second question is, why do Christians lack that zeal or that passion? Why do we lack it? How, how, how do we allow time, circumstances, problems to hinder our passion, our zeal? I, I believe there's a few things. I think the first is because we've allowed something that's precious to become so familiar. Something that's so important. Something that we desire to become average. Something that we feel like we have to do. Something that we feel like, oh, I have to sing. Or I have to read the Bible. Or I have to talk to somebody about Christ. It's not that we have an inner desire anymore, a compelling force within our life. You know, I get to worship I get to be God's ambassador. I get to be part of something bigger than myself. Instead of saying, uh, it's Sunday morning. We're going to sing a few songs and we're going to listen to a sermon. You know, what we have to do is we have to say, what can I learn today that's going to take my life to a whole nother level? What did I learn at camp that's going to desire in my life to transformed to be something greater than myself, to, to change colleges. <laughs> I understand. When I got saved, I was at K-State, and I said I wanted to do something different, and I went to Bible college, and it's awesome to see how God can transfer a passion to education or agriculture into something that is going to be something that's going to change your life. But whatever you do, Whatever occupation, whatever job that you hold, you're still a missionary for Christ in a dark world. Whether you are in Africa or you're in Wichita, it still should be that burning desire, passionate for Christ. What is something so special and precious sometimes just becomes familiar. And when we become familiar, we lose that passion, that zeal. And sometimes we just need the approval of those around us. And if we live our life for the approval of others instead of the approval of God, our zeal will wane because not everybody loves Christ. And if all we want is the approval of others instead of the approval of God, what happens is our zeal, our fire will be put out. And then apathy. Apathy just means the lack of love. I just become apathetic. I just don't have a desire. And that's natural. That's natural in a lot of areas within our life. Have you ever thought about the job that you started and, and when you interviewed for that job and you were excited and you came up, yeah, I got the job. And you're so excited about starting something new and you're so energetic about the future. And all of a sudden, six months, a year down the road, oh, I got to go to work. Oh. I got that stupid boss I got to deal with. And everything that was so exciting at one time so energetic becomes apathetic. It's natural. So in our spiritual life, if that is a natural desire within our life to turn passion into apathy, how do we change our spiritual condition from not ever becoming apathetic, but to continue that burning desire to have life with Christ? And then not only apathy, but people will affect you. People will affect you. I don't think there's a greater illustration than camp itself. 7,000 kids worshiping God. It's kind of easy to worship God with 7,000 kids, isn't it? It's kind of awesome to see people opening the Bible and people making decisions with 7,000 kids. But people will affect you. People. You leave that environment and you go into an environment where 7,000 are against you. When you're in school or you're at the workplace and they are not here to encourage you. They're here to belittle you. You go from a Christian environment to a secular college. Professors and students are here to belittle you. Do we have enough courage and passion 
and zeal within our life to not allow people to deter you from having what God has put into you? There's ways that we lack our zeal. And then what happens when passion is lost? What happens when the passion is lost? There's no greater example than Ephesians chapter 2. When passion is lost. Let's look at what they did. The church. The church was serving the church was serving the church. And he says, I know your deeds. You were busy doing. I know your deeds. You, you were so busy serving, you lose sight of who you're serving. And that's our church today. We get so busy doing things and so busy serving and so busy doing, we lose sight of why we are serving. What ministries do you have? What are we trying to accomplish in those ministries? The church of Ephesus was so busy doing deeds, they forgot why they were doing them. And the church was sacrificing. They were doing hard work. They were doing stuff. And when we, when we have lost our passion, we do things because we have to. And just because we have to, and we go through those redundancy areas of our life, it just becomes hard and dry and boring. And when we become hard and dry and boring spiritually. The camps was thirst. And I loved the illustration of he filled. He, he allowed my thirst to be quenched. And when you're dry and we're hurting and you wonder where God is and you're wondering why all this junk's taking place within my life, sometimes it's just that we are dry. Sometimes we feel like we are having our desert experience and we have no idea how to get out of it. What we need to do is understand that hard work isn't necessarily what God wants you to do. Staying busy isn't necessarily what God wants you to do. Because this church of Ephesus, they were doing everything. But you know what he said? You have left me. Sometimes we should take a step back of hard work, be busy, the redundancy, or the apathetic lifestyle, and say, God, I remember that time that I bowed my knees, whether I was a young adult, or I was a great uh, a student, or I was even in the youth ministry, or I was, a, I was a child, and I bowed my knees before you, and you saved my soul. Now, fervency that you had within your soul the Bible says go back to where you lost your first love get back to a point where you ask God I need my thirst to be quenched I need to get out of this desert land I need to test to test you and to touch you and allow my life to be genuinely open within your life what happens when we have our passion lost we do things out of obligation and not out of passion. So how do I restore my passion? How do I restore my passion? Let me give you some things because I believe this is so important. How do I restore my passion for Christ? Make sure you have a fire in place. Make sure you have a fire started within your life. Make sure that deep desire is deep within your soul. And how do you gain that? There's no way that you can have a passion for Christ until you have a relationship with Christ. If you have a relationship with Christ and he's, he died on the cross for your sins and you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you've, you've given him your life and maybe it's been 20 years or 30 years or 50 years or two days ago, you can't have a passion for something that hasn't been significant within your life. And once salvation has taken place within your life, it, it is significance. It's a transformation from, from an unsaved world to God's family, from unforgiveness to forgiveness, from hell to heaven. Tell me that's not significant. Tell me that you don't care. Tell me that you don't care that your family is dying and going to hell and you are saved 
And because of your salvation, you have the hope and the light of the entire world to transform your family into a salvation experience so they can gain heaven with you. Tell me you're not passionate about that. Tell me you're not passionate about your kids giving their life to Christ. Tell me you're not passionate about somebody that you love that you know they don't have a relationship with Christ. Tell me about this little Palmer boy at 16 years of age. Tell me if he wasn't a believer in Christ and you had a relationship with him, it doesn't break your heart. Because it is significant. It changes everything about our life. It changes everything about what we do. If it is not significant, I would say you do not have a fire in your bosom. But if it is, and you do have a fire, how do we keep it? How do we not allow that fire to go out? You have to focus on that fire. Focus on it. Kindle it. Let it stir up in your soul. You have to exercise. You have to stoke the fire. You have to let people see that I'm not ashamed. I want my fire to burn so bright, to give so much heat, that people can see it. Now, this younger generation, they're not going to remember this, but um, that's older generation. We can remember this. Remember the sun tea? Remember sun tea where your parents would put tea bags and, and a bunch of water and put it out on the deck and uh, the sun would just boil the tea and, and make it. Anybody remember that? Well, my mom and dad, they loved tea. I mean, they would drink tea from 6.30 in the morning till 10.30 at night. And the darker the tea, the better. Unsweet, dark tea. Nasty. <laughs> Disgusting. They would open that jar and it's like brown water. And that's all we had. So dinner time, lunch time, we just poured that jar into that water, and, and it was like dark, nasty tea. It smelled like tea. If it got all over you, you smelled like tea. And I did not like that tea. But I had to drink the tea. So I found out what I could do with that tea. I poured about a quarter of an inch of tea in my glass, filled the rest of it with water, and it looked somewhat like tea, it didn't taste near as bad as their tea. But I had a vision of tea. I could see the tea. Here's my parallel. Sometimes God wants to fill us up with so much of him that we look like Christians, that we smell like Christians. We talk like Christians. We imply what Christ can do within our life to other people that we are full of Christ and we are dark like Christ. But some of us, we want to take just enough of Christ into our glass of life to be safe. Enough that we can look like Christ. Enough that if I taste it, I can taste a little bit like Christ. But I don't want to be saturated with Christ. I don't want him to control everything about me. I just want enough so I can say, I'm a Christian. There's no passion for that. We have to have a deep desire, passion within our life, and focus on our fire, allow that fire to work within our life. And as I said, the fire needs to be stoked. That's our job. Brother, strengthening brother. Stir up the gifts that were within you. Students, if you make that decision at camp, give other students permission to call you on it. What are you doing with that faith? What are you doing with that decision? Parents, those kids just came back from camp. They made strong decisions. What are we going to do about them when their faith is stronger than ours? It is our job to stir up their gifts. It's our job to motivate them. It's our job to let them see Christ in us, not to repel them for Christ, but motivate them for Christ. Stir up their gifts. Stoke that fire. And I associate with passionate people. I believe there's times that we need to go into a dark world. And I believe there's times that we can be a light in a very dark world. But if all we are is light in a dark world, and we don't have that opportunity to be refreshed, to be encouraged, 
to allow people to know that I'm not doing this by myself. It's easy to fall away if all we're doing is investigating and getting into people's lives. We should do that. But we should also passionately be involved with believers to encourage us, to love us, and to help us. How do we do that? We have to surround ourselves with people that will hold us accountable to our faith. That will say, how are you doing spiritually? Hey, you know what you're doing there can make your walk fall apart. You become apathetic in this area. If we do not hold ourselves accountable to other people, and we feel like we are only a light in a dark world, it's very easy to fall dimly lit in a dark world. And if we're dimly lit in a dark world, people aren't going to see Christ in us. They may hear some words that we say. They may see that you go to church. They may see that you have your Bible in your car. Or they may hear something that you sing or some music that you listen to. But they don't see the passion within your life. And people will not follow somebody that just talks but doesn't walk. But when you walk your life and your passion in front of people, they're going to take a step back and they're saying there's something real, genuine, vibrant within your life. That is when people will see Christ in you. And then I believe the biggest one is we have to have prayer. We have to pray for the passion not to be kindled. On a daily basis, get on our knees before God and think about what is God doing within my life, within the church. And get on our knees before God and ask God to passionately give me that desire to open my heart to Christ, not for arrogance sake, but for humility's sake, not for what I want, but for what he wants, and ask God to direct my path. Ask God, who should I share my life with? How should I go? What decisions should I make? But when we get on our knees before God and worship him and thank him for what he has done, and then we say, Lord, give me this day the direction that you want me to go and who I should talk to, God opens up doors that we cannot even comprehend. The, the, the defining moments, that focal point in life where God has brought this person and you together for a collision that only God could ordain. And when you are God's plan for that moment to transform somebody's life, you can say, wow, thanks for the passion. Thanks for the zeal. Thanks for allowing me to be part of a bigger plan. How do we do that? We can't leave our first love. We can't allow the passion that has been built up in you, that is built up within our students, to become so apathetic that we go to church. The church is bigger than what we allow it to be. The church is deep within our soul. It's that moment that God saved you. And he implanted within you the Holy Spirit, that power, that built up ambition within your life to change people's life, to be genuine, not to be apathetic, not to be boring, not to just go through the mode, but to have something real, to be genuinely honest before God, broken to a point that you say, if I have junk within my life that's keeping me from doing what God wants me to do, I want to go back to where I lost my love. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 2, Go back to where you left your first love. Repent, and I will restore. But if you don't repent, I can remove my lampstand from you. Not your salvation, but the joy, the peace, the satisfaction. We can go through life boring instead of transformed in our life. Have you lost your first love? Students, when we start going after Christ right now, how do I keep that zeal? Ask God to keep it alive within my life. What do I need to do to keep it alive? Adults, what do we need to do to re-energize our life, 
to re-energize our church, to re-energize our spiritual faith, my evangelism. How can I keep it? Go back to where you lost it. Go back to where it started from and start fresh and start anew and allow God to do something only he can do. Re-energize, give you purpose, give you passion, and the definition of zeal is enthusiasm. Are you enthusiastic about what God is doing within your life? If you are not, your fire, your passion, your burden has waned. It may still be there, but it's like a coal that's just going dead. We need to stoke it. Allow that enthusiasm for what God wants to do for your spiritual life, for your family's life, for Christ to be rekindled, to keep it fresh, and to keep it hot. Let's not lose our first love. And if we have, let's do whatever we need to to fire back up. The enthusiastic, passionate love for Christ will transform a dead church into a live, healthy, growing entity that Christ died for. Is it worth it? I think it is. I think he died for it. He's called us to do it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, come before us. And as we prepare our hearts for a song, as we're ready for an invitation to give to us a desire to love you, to rekindle our passion for you, to allow Christ to be glorified in everything that we do. Lord, thank you for our students. Thank you for the commitments that they have made. I pray that your hand will be upon them and you'll give to them the very desires of their hearts. But Lord, I pray that the adults, and I pray for the other students, that you will rekindle within their life their love for you and their passion for you. And when people can see them, they see that there's something genuinely real within their life. And it's just Christ. It's worth everything that we have. Your salvation means something. I pray that we never become apathetic to what you've done for us that cost you so much. I pray that you'll give to us the very desires of our heart today. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you.